Hi everybody, this is this is Matthew. Okay. Hello, Matthew. Hello. We already know so much about him. Uh, Matthew is a digital advisor in the cabinet office in the government of Ontario. Yes, okay, so I did get that spot on. Uh, he's also my colleague. I work in the province as well, and we chat on a very regular basis about issues related to civics, issues related to tech specifically, and tech transformation within government. Um, he's a dear friend, a very close friend uh, within the province, and I think he will give us a rousing speech here, even though he tries to pretend to be modest, uh, but he knows his stuff. So, Matthew. Thank you. I've like literally never been introduced before, so like that's a little that's a little thing on like my list of milestones, uh, personal development wise. Uh, yeah, Alex is actually the guy who uh, who I, I think brought me into the open data, open government, civic tech sort of uh, space. Uh, so uh, it's it's really great to you know continue to be uh, involved in that. And I want to thank um, Gabe uh, for putting this together and, and inviting me to this. You know, I think Gabe is, is a fantastic bright spark uh, in this space, and we're so lucky to have him. Um, and um, I'm also excited that all of you have turned out. Uh, you know, clearly you're a very engaged and, and interested bunch, and I'm, I'm very excited to see the, the conversations um, uh, that come out of this and, and the work uh, as well. Um, so, you know, as I've said, like, I'm far from an expert uh, on this, you know, I'm really just an interested citizen and, you know, there's a little bit of overlap with what I do professionally, um, but this has really just been, you know, uh, I had a very brief introduction to this, uh, to this space. So I wanted to talk um, just a little bit about um, what has drawn me to it, uh, you know, what I've found um, to have the most promise or, or the most uh, draw in the space. Uh, and then a couple of, of examples that I've thought have been particularly impactful uh, of civic tech tools. Um, so, you know, I, I noticed that I'm kind of one of the few people uh, who works in government here, so I feel as I've got a little bit to uh, answer for as far as our um, performance or lack thereof in, in uh, how we use technology. I know that um, government doesn't often do a very good job of, of you know, building technology that um, people can actually use and it's, it's a big huge challenge um, and you know it's a there's a lot of different uh, elements to it and it's a huge culture change um, for government really uh, in, in, you know it's the last sector really to um, be transformed by this uh, this recent digital revolution or ongoing digital revolution and I think like um, communities like this one where people can be talking about what that looks like, not just inside government, but outside government, um, and you can start to talk about what that looks like. Um, I think that that's um, you know, a, a very um, very promising step uh, in that direction. So anyway, um, something that uh, I really liked, uh, there's this, this technology writer named Nicholas Carr. Um, he has a blog, and uh, he created this um, uh, hierarchy of innovation, he calls it. It's, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it's for technological innovation. Um, so, you know, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the base of the pyramid, you've got uh, the most necessary, the most basic uh, technologies, uh, you know, things that you need to survive. You can't really, sorry, you can't really see this, so you just imagine a triangle that's like <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, yeah, so all the things you need for, for survival. And then at the very top, you know, you have technologies of the self. Uh, self-expression, uh, identity management, vanity, and things like that. Anyway, I think um, recently uh, our tech sector and you know, sort of the we we've focused a lot on technologies of the self. Like, there's been a lot of brain power that's been spent on you know building new social networks, building things that have been focused on you know people as individuals. And there's kind of been it's kind of been to the neglect of um, the the more basic things, the technologies, uh, as he's calling it, technologies of social organization. So things that are kind of more fundamental. There's not been the same transformation uh, in that space uh, as there has been uh, on these, these personal technologies. So, uh, you know, he talks about that as uh, something where there's, there's a lot of change that has yet uh, to come. Um, so there's this guy, Tom Steinberg, uh, runs a, uh, 
company called My Society, which is a very commercially successful uh, civic tech company in the UK. Uh, he's just, you know, for a definition, kind of defined civic tech as, as uh, something which spurs citizen engagement, improves communities, and makes uh, government more effective. Uh, so my society is kind of one of the, the, the few um, organizations that's been super commercially successful um, at this. They've created a tool called Fix My Street, uh, which is uh, a tool which helps people report issues with local infrastructure. Uh, they've also done projects uh, around transparency and access to information. So uh, there's a, a tool called What Do They Know, which is uh, for simplifying the whole freedom of information request process. Uh, and allowing people to post it online. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that, uh, there's, you know, in most Western democracies, certainly here, there's a piece of legislation uh, which allows citizens to request any piece of information from government, uh, you know, with some limitations, um, to request that that be given to them. Um, so this tool, uh, just as an example, um, takes that process, you know, out of, out of being like a totally paper-based process and brings all of the information uh, online, so that's a very something which government should be able to do, um, but but doesn't. So you know, um, but you know what what really interests me more than uh, the commercial uh, applications of civic tech, I think, is the uh, the instances where it's uh, about communities uh, organizing organically and identifying problems and you know attempting to create novel solutions. You know, they can become commercial, certainly, um, uh, but in a lot of cases, you know, it's a citizen's movement and it's things that are, you know, labors of love. In some cases, there is, you know, foundational funding, um, but uh, it's really something which is driven by citizens. Um, the fact that it's, you know, it's a, that it's a democratic movement and it's tools that are, you know, meant to further um, uh, democratic ideals, I think, is, is very inspiring. Um, so as far as like the kinds of challenges that I think are, are most interesting for civic tech um, to be tackling, uh, it's things that, uh, uh, you know, they're not just, I mean, we've all heard about the, you know, the, uh, the things about potholes or, you know, the, the very um, tangible issues like that, potholes or, you know, fire migrants or, you know, tangible municipal issues, but I think the ones that are most impactful are the ones that um, touch our political institutions, um, that uh, help people in communities uh, that are disempowered, disenfranchised, uh, and actually make a change uh, in, in that regard. So, uh, you know, it's like apps like uh, Legal Swipe, which uh, you may all have heard of, a recent uh, Toronto-based app that um, helps people understand uh, their rights when they're they've been detained by the police, um, you know, very easy way for them to, um, uh, you know, as a, a, an interface that makes it easy for them to sort of navigate that scenario and, and understand what their rights are. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, a great deal of apps that are um, around, um, or I should say civic tech tools that are around uh, advocacy and community organizing. Um, so one great example, which I've found that uh, stands out, uh, there's a, an application called Lumio that's used by Podemos uh, in Spain. So Podemos, if you folks are not familiar, is a, a left-wing uh, party that has surged in popularity in Spain. And they're using this tool to um, form small local collectives um, and to basically delegate decision-making to those um, those collectives. I should say, by the way, if like I'm like wrong on any facts, or you have like something you want to add, I should have said this at the beginning, like something, you know, that uh, you know sparks your your attention, your interest, you know, or you've you've had thoughts about this, like please interrupt me and uh, and speak out. Quick interruption. Podemos is Spanish for we can, which is just kind of fun. Fantastic. Cool. I like that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, there's, you know, there's also um, apps which are really uh, tailored to building participation in existing democratic institutions. Uh, so a local example, uh, uh, you know, it's been termed a voting advice application. Uh, there's something called Vote Compass, which some of you may have used, uh, built in Toronto by Fox Pop Labs, uh, which is helping voters understand how their preferences align to uh, party platforms. 
Um, similarly, uh, you know, it doesn't all have to be uh, <coughs> community organizations that are building these tools. A lot of governments are, are also uh, investing in, in these tools and, and trying to use them to, to build uh, better public services, build online public services that are as good as what you can find in the private sector. Uh, it's either that they're building the applications or they're providing the data or they're building the API, which then powers uh, those applications. Um, you know, there are apps which are, are really about uh, lessening the impact of uh, public austerity. So I have a photo there of George Osborne, the Chancellor of the UK, who recently unveiled an austerity budget, uh, you know, which is, has continued deep cuts to public services. The Conservatives in the UK uh, are very interested. Um, this is sort of a strange and, and seemingly, and it seems a little bit out of place for us here, but they're very interested in, in the potential of civic tech tools actually to, uh, in some instances, replace public services, uh, or at least lessen the impact of cuts to public services. Uh, so they're a big fan, for example, of, of uh, my society. Um, there's tools that uh, also promote government transparency. Um, so, like most of my society's freedom of information and request tool, um, Sunlight Foundation, if you've heard of them, um, has a money politics and, and transparency project, uh, which has been providing data uh, around the influence of, of money in politics. Um, and likewise, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to do given there's not um, perhaps as much. Uh, you know, need for corporations to be uh, transparent like governments are. Um, but there are a lot of tools which are also focused on corporate transparency, so things like Open Corporates, uh, which is a site which aggregates uh, corporate regulatory filings. Anyway, so uh, there were a couple which I wanted to um, specifically look at. I'm not going to do a demo of them, um, you know, just technical limitations, but, you know, by all means, please do, um, you know, have a look at them online on your own. Um, one that I wanted to talk about uh, was um, Discover BPS, Discover Boston Public Schools. Um, so this is obviously an application uh, that was built in Boston. Um, the Boston Public School System um, had um, uh, a registration and school selection process that was labyrinthine and archaic and very difficult to understand. Um, and essentially, um, you know, people found that uh, it was making it very difficult to choose uh, the, the best schools for their, their, to send their children to. Um, so I believe this was built um, by one of the Code for America brigades, you know, so there was an organization there uh, that uh, realized this was impacting certain communities uh, more than others, um, poor communities especially, uh, and thought, you know, why can't we make uh, the process of choosing a school as easy as, you know, booking a flight, you know, why can't we make the kayak for choosing a school. Um, so this application uh, walks people through the whole process, allows you to easily compare different <coughs> schools to each other, find ones that are uh, most appropriate for them, uh, and to, to complete applications. Um, and you know, initially it had a little bit of, of uh, trouble, you know, being a community-supported application initially, but um, towards the towards the middle of this year, it, it got support from the Boston Public School Department, so it actually got um, secured funding. So, you know, these things are often very t tenuous um, innovations. Another one which is, you know, uh, kind of a much bigger picture thing, it's not, um, I'm not saying built by a community, but actually built in government by visionary people in government, some folks who had been brought in by the Obama administration who had um, been leaders in the, the community civic tech space. Um, so the FDA uh, in the States has a, an office of, it's office of uh, information and technology innovation, um, which um, thought that they should tackle uh, the issue of, of uh, adverse drug reactions. So adverse drug reactions are you know, when your, your drugs, your pharmaceuticals um, uh, don't mix well and there's some sort of some sort of adverse reaction to them. Uh, so it's apparently the, the fourth leading cause uh, of death in the United States. Uh, and data about um, adverse drug reactions was um, it had been like locked up in a, a terrible, crappy government website. And pharmaceutical companies and, and doctors and pharmacies and whatnot 
uh, in some cases had to file freedom of information requests to get access to the data that it was just so inaccessible. So the FDA, uh, knowing this, um, uh, used a bunch of fantastic, magical, innovative techniques to uh, standardize and clean up and digitize all of their data. Uh, and working in conjunction with um, uh, some people in the Pacific tech community and some people who were um, commercial app developers, they developed uh, APIs to serve up that data. And it now powers uh, tools like iodine, uh, which um, allows people to review their drugs, you know, how well did it work, how effective was it, what other drugs were they on, you know, what are the side effects and things like that. And so it's powered by, you know, this fantastic data that it, the FDA has, um, but it's actually something that, you know, the private sector has been able to come in and, and monetize um, and, you know, has been able to apply the, you know, the, the best web design principles um, to, to that application, something which, which government is unfortunately not yet uh, able to do. Uh, the last thing which uh, I just wanted to briefly mention um, was the, the Detroit Water Project. I mean, this is a simple one-page website. Uh, you know, it's an example of, of you know, what you can do with um, just a very simple project. Um, uh, it was a web interface. I don't know if, if you folks have heard of it. Um, but uh, in uh, Detroit, uh, there were a lot of people who were unable to pay their water bills, and the city was, was cutting people off, uh, and they, they, you know, they didn't have any water uh, flowing to their homes. So some uh, local civic tech activists created this tool that would allow people to pay the water bill of people in Detroit, uh, people who had not been able to, to pay it themselves. Uh, so they're picking up the slack where public institutions had, had failed to provide them with basic services. And again, just a simple one-page website um, and had an enormous, uh, enormous impact for people. I think that is it. Anyway, those were just some examples. Um, I'm sure you, know, you guys have a lot more that you can share. Yeah, anyway, thank you very much.